The reading today comes from the book of Mark. They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, Son of man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he was saying, and they were afraid to ask him about it. When they came to Capernaum, when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet, because on the way they had argued about who was going to be the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, If anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child and had him stand among them. Taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever comes and welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. The word of the Lord, the house of the Lord. Speaking of little children, one thing we almost forgot today is our Christmas boxes. Now, Gene would have them folded and, and play, and I would make, uh, he, would, he would kind of be funny doing it. So I don't think I'm going to open this, because I think I could be funnier than him trying to put it back together. <laughs> so, so we're going to leave it closed up. But remember to take them with you today, because uh, we get these filled, and they spread, what did they say, 8 million? They sent 8 million of these out across the world for all the people. And remember, there are certain things that you can and can't put in there, and there's a list in the back. But if you take these boxes, there's plenty of them in the back that you can take with you. Today, we're going to talk about our whole church, not just this church. This church doesn't fall into the category of where many churches fall. We're talking about our Methodist church in general, the whole thing. There's a lot of turmoil in our church today. There's a lot of unanswered questions. There are many things that are happening in our church today that have caused a lot of grief. Now, normally they have a big general conference every two years, or every four years, I'm sorry. And they had one two years ago, but they couldn't decide anything. Our leadership was stymied. Everything was put on the table. They, they put it all aside because they could not come to any agreements. They're having another one of these meetings two years later in February, and the general conference will meet again to try to go over and come across all of some of these things that are happening in our church. It's kind of like you've got to have a real solid leader. We had a really good solid leader. The disciples had one in Jesus. We have one in Gene. He's a really good, solid leader. You can count on and you can lean on. So we don't have the problems that a lot of churches have. But with Jesus going away, who would be number one? And they all started squabbling about it. Well, I'm better than you, and so I should be the leader. No, I should be the leader. I and they all were dividing up the good things and the bad things and taking what they could from each other. And Jesus said, this is not how this is supposed to work. If you really want to be the leader, you've got to be last served. You've got to be the last one in line. You've got to make sure that everybody else has what they need before you take yours. Have you ever experienced working for a company and your boss retires. And the company goes out looking for a new person to take, take his place. Now they forget about, you've been there for 15 or 20 years, you know the job, you know the job really well and you've been doing it for, for many years supporting your boss, but they're gonna hire the new guy right out of college. He's got a degree in what? 
He doesn't know anything about the company. He doesn't know anything about what you do. But they have a great idea. You can train him. You train him so that he can be your boss. And they're going to pay him an extra $10,000. They overlook you. They, they, they just don't see you. You're still the young man that they hired 25 years ago who had no background and no experience or anything. And they still see you that way. And I bring that up because this is what happened with Jesus. You know, they were traveling with him. And he was going to retire. Well, he wasn't going to retire. He was going to be leaving him. But they all were fighting who's going to take over. Well, it's this way in life. It's this way in our families. It's this way all over the place. I talked about going back to see my sisters in Ohio. And I'm telling you, they spoiled me rotten. They always do. They, they take care of us like we were still the little kid on the block. I'm 78. I'm, they're 88, 90, and 84. But I'm still the young kid on the block. And they can't do enough for you. They won't let us pay for anything. We can't go out to dinner and pay for anything. We can't get up in the morning and make breakfast for ourselves. We can't even, they even argue about making our bed. Okay, like, she's 90 years old where we stay in my sister's house and she's going to come up and make the bed, right? But they look at us like still we're little kids. And we have to do these things. And it's great that they treat us this way, but, you know, they knew I was coming here. And so my sister Marge is a great cook and a great baker. You can't believe this woman is really super. She's the 88-year-old. She invites us to her house because they eat lunch at 2 o'clock. That's, that's their meal of the day. A huge platter of Lake Erie perch. Have you ever had Lake Erie perch? It's like the best fish you can ever eat. Huge platter. And she makes dessert. And for her birthday in August, she, had, she makes a German chocolate cake every year. So I told her to save me a piece. She says, no, it's too dry. So here, I made one we can have for lunch. Yeah, and here's one for you to take home. So wait a minute. So she invited us, oh, my sister Ellen, she's 90. And she says, listen, uh, I know you like banana cream pot, or banana uh, pudding. So she says, I made you a big bowl of banana pudding. I says, well, you know, I like banana pudding, but it needs vanilla wafers. She says, oh, I have those. <laughs> she had a whole box. So then Marge comes up back again, and she says, I'm glad you came back. Uh, I know you like elderberry pie. We raise our own elderberry, so here's an elderberry pie this big, and it must have weighed four pounds. And a uh, banana with bread pudding for Ellie. And my niece made chocolate grenache. And we, anyway, they knew I was coming here, so they said, well, you've got to fill in for Jean. And I think I'm doing pretty good. <laughs> Don't tell him I said that, please. <laughs> I won't be invited back. <laughs> I may not be invited back anyway, but that's okay. <laughs> so I told Ellie, I said, whatever you do, don't say you want anything. And don't say you like anything because it's going to show up. <laughs> and I say, she, they make this huge afghan for me. Ugh, I'm telling you, it was incredible. The, the two weeks we spent back there, we were just spoiled to, to death. But it was about the same way with Jesus. And you know, he had four brothers and he had two sisters. And the family never accepted him for, for being Jesus, or for, for being, well, anything but a, a snot-nosed kid who was running around in the dirt playing in, in the villages and so forth, like all the other kids did. And he said himself, it's really hard to get people to recognize you as you are because they still see you as you were. Now, James didn't recognize Jesus until after the resurrection. But during this time, he became very involved with the church after Jesus' resurrection. And one of the problems they were having in the church were like the problems we're having today. So he wrote this letter. It's only three pages long. If you, read the, if you get into the Bible and you want to read a short chapter, read, read the book of James. But he's telling them about all the problems and how they, they have to get past them and work things out and work together. 
But he said he addressed it to the 12 tribes. Well, that was kind of silly because 10 of the tribes were over here in the north and they were already captured by, a, by a, one of the other countries that were out there. And he was over here in the Babylonians. He, they only had two tribes and they were all broken up and fighting with each other and the whole thing. Well, our, our situation is the same in the church today. We have people in Africa, we have people in, in Europe, we have people in, in Australia, we have people all over the world that are Methodists. We have different laws, we have different rules, we have different ideas, we have different society, and it's a mess. It's a real mess. And somewhere along the line, no matter what the church decides, we're going to lose 10% of our church. Domestic church. If they go for this new, new, raw, new laws that they want to put in, 10% of the people said they're leaving. If they don't take the new laws, 10% of the other people said they're leaving. So somewhere along the line, we're going to lose 10%. But as an overall church, we're going to lose a lot more. So these are part of the problems that we're facing with the church today. And fortunately, there's no one to write a letter Peter wrote a letter, Matthew wrote a letter, John wrote a letter. They all wrote letters to their churches that were having problems. Who's going to write the letter for us today? Even our, our bishops can't figure out what the problem is, and they can't get together and agree. And if they wrote the letter, who would read it? And who would follow it? So our letter would just kind of be a waste. It certainly wouldn't make it into the Bible. So this is what we're facing today. And I'll tell you something. God is sending us warning signs all over. He's sending us warning signs. And he's telling you. We had the largest fires that we've ever had. We've had floods like you can't believe. We've had tornadoes. We've had hurricanes. We've had, we've had earthquakes. If God isn't talking to us and telling us to straighten yourself out, it's going to be like, Jonah and the whale. Remember Jonah? He was sent to do a mission and he wouldn't do it, so he ran away. So God punished him by having him thrown overboard. And then he came back and he said, okay, okay, I'll do the mission. And then the people got the word that God was going to destroy their town if they didn't straighten out. So they did. They repented. They totally repented. And God says, fine, you're good. I won't bother you. You're... And then Jonah got mad at God. You sent me down there to tell them that you were going to destroy them, and I did that. And now you're not going to do anything. Well, God says they repented. So if they repent, we don't have to do anything. So we have to look at that. We have to look at that as happening today to us. We got the message. Now, the one thing that's interesting about... I, I brag on you all the time, and so does Gene... This church is different. This is a microcosm of the Methodist church. All summer long, you, the core of this church, hold it together and work with each other. And you do marvelous things. That new floor, the new bathrooms, the new uh, Aunt North Hall, the, all the paint. If you look in the kitchen, the, it's been repainted. It is fabulous, beautiful. This is happening with the core of this church. And nobody has to go and say, well, will you do it, please? Or will you do it? You just do it. And that's what's happening. But come the wintertime, and when fall, welcome to fall, by the way, second day of fall. What happens is, they're going to start coming back, all of our winter guests, what we call our snowbirds, are going to be coming back. And they're going to mingle in amongst you. And you know what's remarkable about this church? It's they all fit in. They're coming from all over, but they get here and they mesh. They all fit in. They're all willing to help. They're all willing to work. They're all willing to put money in. They're, all, they're, they're ready. And you know something? They've missed the last six months that they weren't here because they loved coming here on Sunday and being with you and being with Jean. But this church is so different. So when Jean says there's problems in the whole church and there's going to be all kinds of changes, and you know what? 
He told you last week. We are going to be us. We're not changing. We do everything right. Thank God, thank you. <laughs> we do it right. So we don't have to adjust to change all this stuff. We just have to keep doing what we're doing. And we make a difference. We send all those people back to where they live with this feeling, hey, there is a great little church in Fort Mojave, Mojave Valley, United Methodist, and they do it right, and we love being there with them. So we can say thank you to God for the blessings he's given us. You know, so many pastors would, would love to be able to come to this church, and I am so lucky to have a small connection here that means so much to me. This has been in my heart for, God, 12 years now? 12 years now? She doesn't remember how long, but then it's been 12 years, I think. Seven years here and then five almost in Texas. But we keep coming back, and you're having trouble getting rid of me, I know. But Gene said, don't worry, there'll be somebody to drive you to the airport. There'll be a lot of people willing to get rid of you out of there. So, <laughs> so anyway. But as a wrap-up, I can only say this to you. Stay true to God. Stay true to your church. Stay true to your faith. And stay true to your pastor, because you've got a winner. Yeah, buddy. Amen. Blessed is Father, thank you for the many blessings that you give our church. Thank you for watching over us and caring for us and keeping us close to you. May the Lord be with you. And may his spirit look down upon you and take care of you. May love pervade this church as it always does. And I look forward to meeting you again next week. <laughs> Amen. <laughs>